Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic's going to be. Joining me this week is Nadia Castle. Hello. Hi, welcome back. Uh, very nice to be back. Unexpected, yeah. but nice. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm glad you came back. I was worried I might have frightened you off with the history of lobotomy. Uh, yeah, but no, you're uh, brave enough to just, say yes. <laughs> let's just get straight into pickaxes into eyes. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a good, good start. Thank you. I promise you there's no pickaxes in eyes in this story. Oh, thank God. I can't promise other horrible things, but no pickaxes. I will promise you that. I will bite the table in anticipation. <laughs> This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Gary Webb was born on the 31st of August 1955 in Corona, California. He was one of only two children in his family. His father was a marine sergeant and the family often moved during his childhood. When his father was released from the Marine Corps, the family settled down in the suburbs of Indianapolis, where Gary and his brother attended a local high school. Hmm. This could go in many directions, but keep going. (laughs) After high school, Gary attended an Indianapolis community college on a scholarship until his family moved to Cincinnati. He then transferred to nearby Northern Kentucky University. Gary began writing on the student newspaper at his college in Indianapolis, and after transferring to Northern Kentucky, he entered its journalism program and wrote for the school paper, The Northerner. This all seems very pleasant so far. Yeah. Not every story on my show is bad. Well, yeah, there's a lot of um, nice stories. I, I, I've still got terrible memories of Heil Honey, I'm Home, which was like the... <laughs> Jesus Christ, why did anyone think that was a good idea? <laughs> but it's one of the few stories I've done where no one actually died. So in retrospect, it's a good episode. (laughs) Well, you're uh, filling me with hope for this one. (laughs) Although he attended Northern Kentucky for four years, he did not finish his degree. Instead, he found work in 1978 as a reporter at the Kentucky Post, a local paper affiliated with the larger Cincinnati Post. In 1979, at the age of 24, Gary married Susan Bell, and the two of them would go on to have three children together. Seems like a very nice man all round. Yeah, Gary's Gary's a nice guy. Yeah. Gary went into investigative journalism and his first work appeared in 1980 when The Post published The Coal Connection, a 17-part series by Gary and Post reporter Thomas Chafee. The series, which examined the murder of a coal company president with ties to organised crime, won the National Investigative Reporters and Editors Award for reporting from a small newspaper. That's a very, very long award title. It is. <laughs> that would be a hell of a trophy. Maybe it was like a medallion, just like a giant, like a clock. In 1983, Gary moved to the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper, where he continued doing investigative work. In 1985, the series Doctoring the Truth uncovered problems in the state medical board. It led to an Ohio House investigation, which resulted in major revisions to the State Medical Practice Act. Gary then moved to the paper's State House Bureau, where he covered statewide issues, winning numerous regional journalism awards. I'm quite impressed at how many different little, you know, regional awards there are. In 1988, Gary was recruited by the San Jose Mercury News. He was assigned to its Sacramento Bureau, where he was allowed to choose most of his own stories. You know, you want a job where you do what you like. Yeah, well, it sounds good. He's winning awards, (laughs) getting to choose his own stories. It's pretty good. Mm. As part of the Mercury News team that covered the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, Gary and his colleague Pete Carey wrote a story examining the reasons for the collapse of the Cypress Street viaduct. 
The Mercury News coverage of the earthquake won its staff the Pulitzer Prize for general news reporting in 1990. Mm -hmm. In 1995, Gary began researching an article entitled Dark Alliance. The -hmm. series was published in the Mercury News in three parts, from August 18th to 20th, 1996. Was it a a Star Wars fan fiction? It's got that kind of vibe. (laughs) It was published in the Mercury News in three parts, from August 18th to 20th, 1996. Okay, I don't know, I can see somebody posting it online. This is why Ray was stupid and why Luke came and saved the galaxy, really. The story consisted of one long article and one or two shorter articles appearing each day. Mm-hmm. It was also posted on the Mercury News website with additional information, including documents cited in the series and audio recordings of people quoted in the articles. What was this, 2000? 1996. That was quite forward thinking for 96. Yeah, Yeah, and it's not a major, this isn't like uh, the New York Times or anything like that. This is an average run of the mill small newspaper. Yeah, Yeah, that's uh, quite impressive. The website artwork for the story showed the silhouette of a man smoking a crap pipe superimposed (laughs) over the CIA logo. So, Alex Jones? (laughs) According to the article, In the 1980s, when the CIA exerted a certain amount of control over contra drug trafficking groups such as the FDN, the agency, as well as the US Drug Enforcement Administration, granted amnesty to, and put on the agency's bankroll, important contra supporters and fundraisers. They were known to the US government to be cocaine smugglers. Ah. Later, the Reagan administration began to use Contra drug money to support anti-communist Nicaraguan rebels' efforts against the Sandinista government. Yes, uh, quite... uh, I think I remember seeing a documentary about drug smuggling in Miami, which addressed, you know, taking down the uh, communists and that. Never mentioned that they were, you know, funding their side of the Cold War the exact same way. Yeah, it's um, some dodgy stuff. (laughs) <laughs> very, very sinister, creepy stuff. The lead of the first article set out the series' basic claims that, for the better part of a decade, a San Francisco Bay Area drug ring sold tons of cocaine to the Crips and Blood street gangs of Los Angeles and funneled millions in drug profits to a Latin American guerrilla army run by the US Central Intelligence Agency. It's kind of surreal. Yeah. So, You'd think it was just a tinfoil hat kind of thing, but no, <laughs> it's like, yeah, pretty well known. Yeah, well, he's. It's the kind of thing where people would expect this more nowadays, but this time this right. is a big I claim that the CIA is basically using drug dealers to fund a foreign war. Well, this was um, when the X Files and things started to pick up, wasn't it? 96. The whole, you know, the government's a secret, shady, terrible thing was sort of being fueled by this kind of investigation yeah. it's where we realize that the government might not be a good thing what how can you say that mm. the government has <laughs> always got our best interests at heart you know the, the, all the crack cocaine and things <laughs> he said that the drug ring opened the first pipeline between Colombia's cocaine cartels and the black neighborhoods of los angeles and as a result the cocaine that flooded in helped spark a crack explosion in urban america yeah that was a uh... I can't remember, in the late 80s, it was nearly every major city in America, I think, got suddenly infested with crack cocaine. Yeah, it was a major, was like major it, problem. Yeah, and it never, they never got a handle on it for most of the decade, really. Well, if uh, the CIA wanted well, this to happen, would they get Certain get blind eyes have been... <laughs> yeah, true. But, um, yeah, I think I remember it started to die down, but only after so many people had died from overdosing on it that... Like the next generation of kids were like, we're not touching that. The series focused on three men. Ricky Ross, Oscar Danilo Blandon, and Norwin Menez. Ricky Ross is a great name. Yeah. Um, that sounds like an Air Force pilot in Fallout. <laughs> um, there, there's there's whole reams of stuff online about Ricky Ross. He's an interesting figure. Um mm. Ross was a major drug dealer in Los Angeles. Um, Blandon and Menendez were Nicaraguans who smuggled drugs into the US and supplied dealers such as Ross. After introducing the three, the first article discussed primarily Blandon and Menendez and their relationship with the Contras and the CIA. 
Mm -hmm. Much of the article highlighted the failure of law enforcement agencies to successfully prosecute them and suggested that this was largely due to their Contra and CIA connections. It's a pretty good defence. Sorry, um, you know I've got the CIA bankrolling me, so... The second article described Blandon's background and how he began smuggling cocaine to support the Contras. Menendez, an established smuggler and a Contra supporter as well, taught Blandon how to smuggle and provided him with cocaine. When Ross discovered the market for crack in Los Angeles, he began buying cocaine from Blandon. Blandon and Menzes' high-volume supply of low-priced, high-purity cocaine allowed Ross to sew up the Los Angeles market and move on. In city after city, local dealers either bought from Ross or got left behind. So, Grand Theft Auto wing it, so hostile takeover? Yeah, Ross, this is why there's so much on him. He he wasn't just, even though he's San Francisco-based, he wasn't just a local San Francisco dealer. He owned an empire. Yeah, he wasn't a drug dealer, he was the drug dealer. Yeah, pretty much one of the biggest cocaine dealers in America. In the 80s, that's quite a claim. Yeah, well, a lot of it, a lot of the smaller dealers came through him as well. He was the guy who oversaw so much of it, so even if you didn't think you were getting it from mm. from Ross, it was, it was still coming through him and his connections. The third article in the series discussed the social effects of the crack trade, noting that it had a disparative effect on African Americans. Asking why crack became so prevalent in the black community of Los Angeles, the article credited Blandon, referring to him as the Johnny Appleseed of crack in California. That's a wonderful paragraph. I wish I could write something <laughs> like that. You, sir, are the Johnny Appleseed of crack. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite interesting. that this. So this was all Los Angeles based. Well, based out of Los Angeles and then spreading outwards. Yeah, a lot of it because of the uh, a lot of the gang violence and poor neighbourhoods in LA, They uh, Gary did focus a lot on that. Yeah, like I say, there's, um, there was a lot of cocaine coming into Miami in that period, but that was coming from the uh, communist rebels in Colombia, which mm. the Americans eventually sent the army in to stop the smuggling, but they were quite happy to have it coming into black neighbourhoods in Los Angeles from their guys. Yeah. Are, are I'm just surprised? sensing a certain sort of, <laughs> sort of discrepancy here. It's interesting. I I've never actually heard this part of it. Like I said, I thought it was entirely a sort of southeastern sort of American problem. Hmm. But then again, that sort of changed to being build a wall across Mexico to stop drug smuggling policies. So <laughs> things don't really change, do they? Same shit, different package. Ah, that's cheerful. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> <I'm> with it. <laughs> the article also found disparities in the treatment of black and white traffickers in the justice system. Are we surprised? Well, gosh, thank God we don't. Thank God we live in more enlightened times now. Eh? <laughs> Once again, thank God we've moved on so much. The article contrasted the treatments of Blandon and Ross after their arrests for drug trafficking. Because Blandon cooperated with the DEA, he spent only 28 months in prison, became a paid government informer, and received permanent resident status. Hmm. Ross was also released early after cooperating in an investigation of police corruption but was re-arrested a few months later in a sting operation arranged with the help of Blandon. Was uh, Ross was Ross a white man? Ross is black. Ross is black, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the article suggested it was retribution for Ross's testimony in the corruption case, but racism could have also played a big factor in that. Quite possibly. But, you know, we wouldn't want to suggest anything, but... Hmm. No, no. It's, it's not like we can look at things today and see how many black Americans are arrested for having a spliff, but how all these white people are starting cannabis businesses and nothing happens to them. It's, it's, you know. Oh, no, it's uh, better, remember. If, 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 you stop, if you stop a crazed gunman but you're black, the police will turn up and shoot you. Yeah. However, if you, you know, machine gun 500 people but you're a white guy, they'll arrest you and take you to, for McDonald's. Oh, white people. We're just the worst. Yeah. And we're, we're British as well, so we fucked up so much of the world, so... Yeah, but we don't like <laughs> we don't like to talk about that. We like to pretend that it's everyone else's fault. Damn Europe. <laughs> it's all your fault. After the publication of Dark Alliance, the Mercury News continued to pursue the story, publishing follow-ups to the original series for the next three months. Other newspapers were slow to pick up the story, but African Americans quickly took note, especially in South Central Los Angeles, where the dealers discussed in the series had been active. They responded with outrage to the series charges. Hmm, surprising. 
Oh, as in, you mean outrage at what it revealed? I init- I thought you initially meant outrage that he'd said it. I was like, really? <laughs> I mean, that's... Well, if some of these people are on the payroll as well, they, uh, you know, yeah. might be outraged from that point of view. That can uh, can be an issue. <laughs> it's the thing with conspiracies, you never know how far they spread. That's a problem with conspiracies. Everyone's out to get you for them. California Senators Barbara Boxer and Diane Feinstein also took note and wrote to CIA Director John Dutch and Attorney General Janet Reno, asking for investigations into the articles. Hmm, creepy. Maxine Waters, the representative for California's 35th District, which also included South Central Los Angeles, was outraged by the articles and became one of Gary's strongest supporters. Bill Clinton was in power at this point, wasn't he? Uh, 96, yeah. Yeah, just um, with the Republican sort of backlash, I wonder if that was when they were still in power or not. But no, yeah, it was Clinton by this point. Waters urged the CIA, the DOJ and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence to investigate the claims. By the end of September, three federal investigations had been announced. An investigation into the CIA allegations conducted by CIA Inspector General Frederick Hitz. An investigation into the law enforcement allegations by Justice Department Inspector General Michael Bromwich. And a second investigation into the CIA by the House Intelligence Committee. I'm sensing a sort of um, clash of interests here. What, the CIA investigating itself? Yeah, um, you know. (laughs) I, I don't see how there could be a clash there. I'm thinking of all those things before Enron collapsed. Through. It was like, don't worry, we've done an internal investigation and everything's fine. <laughs> no worries. Fine. <laughs> Until it all fell to bits. But yeah, other than that, it was fine. Gary's continuing reporting also triggered a fourth investigation. The first article in Dark Alliance that discussed the failure of law enforcement agencies to prosecute both Blandon and Menes had mentioned several cases. One of these was a 1986 raid on Blandon's drug organisation by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, which the article suggested had produced evidence of CIA ties to drug smuggling that was later suppressed. That's got to be quite scary if you're a police officer and you find that. Yeah, it's uh, obviously your first instinct would be we've got to follow this up, but also this is the CIA. If we follow this up... I don't know. If I I was raiding someone and found a big official CIA-looking document, I'd probably just quietly push it aside. (laughs) No, 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 no. no, I'm I'm not willing to wash up in a canal somewhere. When Gary wrote another story about the raid evidence in early October, it received wide attention in Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department began its own investigation into Dark Alliance's claims. After the announcement of federal investigations into the claims made by the series, other newspapers began investigating, and several papers ultimately published articles suggesting the series' claims were overstated. Was this from the bigger newspapers? or It was. The first detailed article on the claims appeared in the Washington Post in early October. The article said that Available information did not support the claims and that the rise of crack was a broad-based phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The New York Times published two articles on the series in mid-October. One, dealing mostly with the response of the Los Angeles black community to the stories, described the series' evidence as thin. It noted the controversy over Gary's contact with Ross's lawyer. The other article, citing interviews with current and former intelligence and law enforcement officials, questioned the importance of the drug dealers discussed in the series, both in the crack cocaine trade and the supporting of Nicaraguan Contras fighters against the Sandinista government. I can sort of, you know, there's always a backlash to any kind of reporting, but Mm -hmm. it's a bit weird that nobody really picked up on this story until there had to be a backlash. Yeah, it stayed under the radar until the official investigations. Hmm started up and now everyone's reporting on it well rushing to report that it's not true basically yeah i don't i I don't believe in the whole you know the media is controlled by people but (laughs) you know there are some common interests in the los angeles times devoted the most space to the story developing its own three-part series called the cocaine trail the series ran from october 20th to 22nd in 1996 and was researched by a team of 17 reporters The three articles in the series were written by four reporters, Jesse Katz, Doyle McManus, John Mitchell, and Sam Fullwood. The first article by Katz developed a different picture of the origins of the crack trade than Dark Alliance had described, with more gangs and smugglers participating. The second article by McManus 
was the longest of the series and dealt with the role of Contras in the drug trade and CIA knowledge of drug activities by the Contras. Mm-hmm. McManus found Blandon and Menez's contributions to the Contras organisations significantly less than the millions claimed in the series, and no evidence that the CIA had tried to protect them. Mm-hmm. The third article by Mitchell and Forward covered the effects of crack on the African-American community and how it affected their reactions to some of the rumours that arose from the Dark Alliance series. I was really hoping you weren't going to say, wrote an article saying, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> After all, uh, crack could be a good thing. Well, I think it's probably a, a decade before you might have had that, so... <laughs> I don't know. You we're not that far off in a lot of cases. Yeah, that is true. We still have people today writing, here's why the Black Death was good for Europe. <laughs> so jumping forward a bit towards the end of this story, just to hear a quote from one of these reporters about this series. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesse Katz said that described the newspaper's coverage as an LA Times reporter. We saw this series in the San Jose Mercury news and kind of wondered how legit it was and kind of put it under a microscope. And we did it in a way that most of us who were involved in it, I think, look back on it and say it was overkill. We had this huge team of people at the LA Times and kind of piled on one lone muckracker up in North California. And we really didn't do anything to advance his work or illuminate much of the story. And it was really kind of a tawdry exercise designed to ruin the reporter's career. So more of, in retrospect, they saw it as more of a hit piece than a... Yeah actual investigation they from his description it sounds like they just wanted to tear apart the original article they went in with that goal i can see how it's not necessarily a sort of conspiracy angle i mean there's a lot of money in just ripping people's articles apart Mm -hmm. just like you know click on anything on youtube and you can get why such and such a body is wrong about what they said yeah let's think if if Someone's written this article that's exploded, it's huge, it's this this big thing, and you turn around and say, well, we've got all the answers that say how this is wrong and go against it. You want to make that big and flashy and this huge Mm. series because then people go, okay, we've read that side, now let's read this side and it'll help your sales. So yeah, from Mm. from a marketing point of view, from the aim of selling papers, it makes sense to go and do this huge piece on why it wasn't right. Yeah. But at the same time, if there is a government conspiracy, you're also going to be writing articles like this. So You can see how people lost a lot of faith in journalism. Yeah. Surprised by the Washington Post article, the Mercury News executive editor, Jerry Sepos, wrote to the Post defending the series. The Post refused to print his letter. Hmm. Sepos also asked reporter Pete Carey to write a critique of the series for publication in the, new, in the Mercury News and had the controversial website artwork changed. I can, I mean, I can see why. That's quite a striking image. Carey's critique appeared in mid-October and went through several of the post-criticisms of the series, including the importance of Blandon's drug ring in spreading crack, questions about Blandon's testimony in court, and how specific series allegations about CIA involvement had been given Carey's responses. When the Los Angeles Times series appeared, Sepos again wrote to defend the original series. He also defended the series in interviews with all three papers. Mm -hmm. The extent of the criticism, however, convinced Sepos that the Mercury News had to acknowledge to its readers that the series had been subjected to strong criticism. He did this in a column that appeared on November 3rd, defending the series, but also committing the paper to to a review of major criticisms. So it's not saying they're wrong, but they have to kind of acknowledge that it's now criticised? Yeah, they're basically saying we're not retracting what we said, but people are saying we did wrong so we are going to look into their allegations and see if we did rather than just saying yeah we made a mistake they're like no we're we're standing by what we what we put out there is it the same as um whenever somebody's disagreed with ever every time they appear on something now they have to be controversial such and such a body rather than just you know well half the time wrong or disagreed with seppo's column drew editorial responses from both the new york times and the washington post An editorial in the Times, whilst criticising the series for making unsubstantiated charges, conceded that it did find drug smuggling and dealings by Nicaraguans with at least tentative connections to the Contras and called for further investigations. Hmm? The Post response came from the paper's ombudsman, who harshly criticised the series. He said, 
it was reported by a seemingly hot-headed fellow willing to have people leap to conclusions his reporting couldn't back up. He called the series flawed and said it was unforgivable, careless journalism. He also criticised the Post's editor for defending the series. It's quite strikingly aggressive. Yeah, it's uh, stories generating a lot of anger. (laughs) Mm. In contrast, the series received support from Steve Weinberg, a former executive director of investigative reporters and editors. In a long review of the series' claims in the Baltimore Sun, Weinberg said, I think the critics have been far too harsh. Despite some hyped phrasing, Dark Alliance appears to be praiseworthy investigative reporting. After the series' publication, the Northern California branch of the National Society of Professional Journalists had voted Gary Journalist of the Year for 1996. Doing too badly, at least. Yeah, I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure that's going to go as well with his very, very long title trophy, but it's something. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's worth noting that a lot of the big papers came in and criticised, but experts in the field are saying no, he did good work. So, mm. Poss- I mean, maybe just plain old jealousy, to be honest. So the board received um, requests to reconsider the award based on the controversy. Uh, but they went ahead and awarded it to Gary. The Mercury News spent the next several months conducting an internal review of the story. The review was conducted primarily by editor Jonathan Krim and reporter Pete Carey, who had written the paper's first published analysis of the series. Carey ultimately decided that there were problems with several parts of the story and wrote a draft article incorporating his findings. The paper gave Gary permission to visit Central America again to get more evidence supporting his story. By January, Gary filed reports of four more articles based on his trip, but his editors concluded that the new articles would not help shore up the original series' claims. Hmm. Seems like a bit of a waste sending in there, then. Go and give us information for four articles. Ah, we're not going to use them. We're going to pay you to go on holiday, but um, yeah, this is, this is no good. The editors met with Gary several times in February 1997 to discuss the results of the paper's internal review, and eventually decided to print neither Carey's draft article nor the article had, Gary had filed. Mm-hmm. Gary was allowed to keep working on the story and made one more trip to Nicaragua in March. At the end of March, however, Sepos told Gary that he was going to present the internal review findings in a column. After discussion with Gary, it was published on May 11th, 1997. In the column, Sepos continued to defend parts of the article, writing that the series had solidly documented that the drug ring established in the series did have connections with Contras and did sell large quantities of cocaine in inner city Los Angeles. Sepos also wrote the series did not meet our standards in four areas. Hmm. He said it presented only one interpretation of conflicting evidence and in one case did not include information that contradicted a central assertion of the series. Two, The series estimates the money involved was presented as fact instead of an estimate. Three, the series oversimplified how the crack epidemic grew. And four, the series created impressions that were open to misinterpretation through imprecise language and graphics. So they're basically just saying that they fluffed it up a bit too much. Yeah, they're they're kind of saying that Gary wanted a certain result at the end and geared his language towards mm. that. That's, yeah, that's pretty much journalism for you. Mm-hmm. Sepos noted that Gary did not agree with these conclusions and said, how did these shortcomings occur? I believe that we fell short at every step of our process in the writing, editing and production of our work. Several people here shared the burden, but ultimately the responsibility was and is mine. So at least he's, he's, yeah, kind, he's of kind of throwing of... Gary under the bus there saying, he made all these cock-ups, but saying, ultimately, it was my fault because I'm in charge. So yeah, a little bit uh, of... Better than we'd expect from our newspapers, anyway. Yeah, you know, he's got a little bit of uh, integrity. To Sli- sliver of integrity. However, Gary strongly disagreed with Sepos's column, and in interviews was harshly critical of the paper's handling of the story. Editors at the paper felt that Gary had failed to tell them about information that contradicted the series' claims, and that he responded to concerns not with reasoned argument, but with accusations of us selling him out. I can sort of see why he'd think that. Yeah. Given they basically rubbish his articles, sent him on holiday, and then didn't do anything with what we found out. In June 1997, 
The Mercury News told Gary it was transferring him from the paper's Sacramento bureau and offered him a choice between working at the main offices in San Jose under closer editorial supervision or spot reporting in Cupertino. Both locations were long commutes from his home in Sacramento. Gary chose Cupertino but was unhappy with the routine stories he was reporting there and the long commute. So they kicked him down to yep. boring, jo- uh, boring jobs, basically. Yeah, that is basically you can go and do boring jobs or you can still do flashier jobs, but we will look over every single word you write with a fine tooth comb. It's like he's he's getting screwed either way. Journalism's not as glorious as politics, is it? Where you get, you know, we'll make you minister of fishing or something <laughs> like that. You know, at least you get to be called a minister then. Yeah. Gary's wife would later go on to state that after the reassignment, he was given poor assignments and disliked the job. She said they had him writing obituaries. The first story he had to file was about a police horse that died of constipation. (laughs) Oh, that's brilliant. I kind of want to read that article. I'm more interested in that than the drug smuggling. (laughs) Was was horse constipation stories not stimulating enough? I, I guess after you've gone from breaking stories of the cia using drug money to fund to fund foreign rebellions having to write how a horse died because it couldn't shit is a bit of a step (laughs) down oh some people are just so snooty i know so full of them i was reporting on the dark secrets of the u.s government and now this poor horse keeled over and died because it was (laughs) backed up the reports of the three federal investigations into dark alliance which we mentioned earlier were not released until over a year after the publication The reports rejected the series' main claims, but were critical of some CIA and law enforcement actions. The Department of Justice Inspector General's report was released in July 1998. The report covered actions by the Department of Justice employees in the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the DEA, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and U.S. Attorney's Office. Not the CIA? No. Mm. It found that the allegations contained in the original article were exaggerations of the actual facts. After examining the investigations and prosecutions of the main figures in these series, Blandon, Menez and Ross, it concluded, Although the investigations suffered from various various problems of communication and coordination, their success and failures were determined by the normal dynamics that affect the success and scores of investigations of high-level drug traffickers. These factors, rather than anything as spectacular as systematic effort by the CIA or any other intelligence agency to protect the drug trafficking activities of Contra supporters, determined what occurred in these cases we examined. That's a very, very long, long jargony way of saying it's someone else's fault. Yeah, it's these weren't thrown out because of a conspiracy. It's just the way that it goes sometimes. Mm. But you have to write it as a whole paragraph, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you've got a word count to hit. It also concluded that the claims that Blandon and Menez were responsible for introducing crack cocaine into South Central Los Angeles and spreading the crack epidemic throughout the country were unsupported. However, it did. Sorry, find... did they just did, did they write that off that they were drug dealers essentially? No, they they admit that they were drug dealers, but they're saying they're not the guys who brought crack into LA. They're not the, the responsible ones. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're not the guys who started it all. No, that's, from the way it was worded, it sounded like they were saying they didn't do anything wrong. I'm like, but they were no, no. raided by the police. They obviously <laughs> did something wrong because they were raided multiple times. No, it, it did admit that they were major drug dealers. It said um, they were guilty of enriching themselves at the expense of countless drug users and right. that they had contributed money to the Contra cause. We did not find their activities were responsible for the crack cocaine epidemic in South Central L.A., much less the rise of crack throughout the nation, or that they were a significant source of support for the Contras. So they're saying, you know, they yes, they're, they're drug dealers, but they're not the giant cogs that the article was saying. Uh, the report called several of its findings troubling. It found that Blandon received permanent resident status. <laughs> Sorry, that's a, that's a fine word. <laughs> Yeah. It's not and a problem, that is it's in, that is in troubling. quotes as well. The troubling is what they Oh, used. God, yeah, just, just to make it that much worse. It found that Blandon received permanent resident status, quote, in a wholly improper manner, and that for some time the department 
was not certain whether to prosecute Menez or using as a cooperating witness. Regarding issues raised in the series' shorter sidebar stories, it found that some in the government were not eager to have DEA agent openly probe activities at ooh, Ilopango Airport in El Salvador, where covert operations in support of the Contras were undertaken, and that the CIA had indeed intervened in a case involving drug smuggler Julio Zavala. The report concluded that these problems were, and again a quote, a far cry from the type of broad manipulation and corruption of the federal criminal justice system suggested by the original allegations. So again, some fancy way of does, saying, this yeah, is, we've done some dodgy is, stuff, but it's not a conspiracy. It's just This is definitely stuff. the 90s, isn't it? It's that age of spin doctor yeah. sort of, it, well, we'll <laughs> just say something as long as it sounds okay, it's fine. We didn't. Uh, we didn't burn. We didn't burn that village down. We redistributed the heating system. <laughs> yeah. to speak. The CIA Inspector General's report was issued in two volumes. According to a report, the Inspector General's office examined all information the agency had relating to CIA knowledge of drug trafficking allegations in regards to any person directly or indirectly involved in contra activities. It also examined how CIA handled and responded to information regarding allegations of drug trafficking by people involved in Contra activities or support. Was this before, like, people... Because now we just know that the CIA did this. Is this before people accepted or knew this kind of stuff? I don't think the CIA was as openly known for being as dodgy as they were at this point. Mm, It's it's a very strange Because this is still very early, early stages of the internet, so... A lot of this information wouldn't be spread out there as it is now. You can go on to so many websites and they've got scanned documents and testimonies and stuff. But it probably wouldn't have been out there back then. So I think it'd still be a case of nah, the government, you know, they're the good guys. You know, they they wouldn't that's lie to us or do these wrong I things. It's, yeah, it's the post-Reagan, I suppose, sort of idea. But yeah, it's weird to think that anyone at any point didn't just assume the CIA were evil. <laughs> Well, they're fighting communism, so they can't be evil. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we were just bringing civilization to the people of India. The first volume of the report found no evidence that any past or present employees of the CIA or anyone acting on behalf of the CIA had any direct or indirect dealings with Ross, Blandon, Menez, or that any other figures mentioned in Dark Alliance were ever employed by or associated with or contacted by the agency. That is incredibly specific for a denial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never even knew they existed. None of our employees, or people who did work for us, or didn't work for us, knew them, knew of them, spoke to them, or anyone who knew that. It's like they're, they're really trying to cover all bases. <laughs> they're pulling the um, uh, Uncle Phil in Fresh Prince when Carlton's hallucinating. I have no recollection of the events in question. <laughs> I have no recollection of the event in question. Pretty much. It found nothing to support the claims that the drug trafficking activities of Blandon and Menez were motivated by any commitment to support the Contra cause or Contra activities undertaken by CIA. It noted that Blandon and Menez claimed to have donated money to Contra sympathisers in Los Angeles, but found no information to confirm that it was true or that the agency had ever even heard of it. The intelligence agency had never heard of this. The people yep. whose job it is to know things have never heard of this. They have no recollection of the events in question. <laughs> Maybe we should go into uh, intelligence. I could do it. I forget everything, so I'd be good in intelligence. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Remember when you said that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? I have no recollection of that. The report also said it found no information to support the claim that the agency interfered with law enforcement actions against Ross Blandon or Menez. After his resignation from the Mercury News, Gary expanded the Dark Alliance series into a book that responded to the criticisms of the series and described his experiences writing the story and dealing with the controversy. It was published in 1998 as Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras and the Crack Cocaine Explosion. A revised edition was published in 1999 that incorporated Gary's response to the CIA and Justice Department reports. The February 2000 report by the House Intelligence Committee in turn considered the book's claims as well as this initial article. 
In interviews after leaving the Mercury News, Gary described the 1997 controversy as media manipulation. He said, The government side of the story is coming through the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. They use the giant corporate press rather than saying anything directly. If you work through friendly reporters on major newspapers, it comes off as the New York Times saying it and not the mouthpiece of the CIA. Yeah, it's um, the lines are starting to blur a bit here. See, you could easily look at this and go, he's just gone off the deep end. He's seeing conspiracy theories. But at the same time, the CIA interfering with the media to try and get their view across. It's like, I can see it. I can believe it. Well, there is literal sort of documentation of it happening now. It's just we don't have anything sort of 80 onwards. It's all, you know, Vietnam and things like that. Clamping down on the Panthers and the hippie movements. Mm. Always very good at media warfare. <laughs> like Russia is now, I suppose. Trump tries to be, but bless him, he's a twat. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, he tries his best, but I mean... Mm. It's like a kid trying to paint the wall. I mean, they've done their best, but the crayons are just <laughs> everywhere. Gary's longest response to the controversy was in The Mighty Willitzer Plays On, a chapter he contributed to an anthology of press criticism. He said, If we had met five years ago, you wouldn't have found a more staunch defender of the newspaper industry than me. And then I wrote some stories that made me realise how sadly misplaced my bliss had been. The reason I'd enjoyed so much smooth sailing for so long hadn't been, as I assumed, because I was careful and diligent and good at my job. The truth was that, in all those years, I hadn't written anything important enough to suppress. Um, you, I don't know. This, this is, um, you always get people who got shunned for something who come out going, oh, it's a conspiracy. I know that's stupid, uh, a centrist balance, you know, kind of fun thinking, but I do know lots of people who've been sacked for being rubbish at their jobs who went, oh, God, they just hate me. Mm. No, you just got to, you yeah, just weren't very good at your job. But in this case, so far, uh, how are you feeling? Is is Gary? You know, has he been targeted by the CIA because he was on the right page, or did he make a lot of bullshit claims and now he's got the fallout for it? It's difficult. I, it's probably because he's a journalist. He no doubt did flip it up because that's what journalism is. Mm. But that's a hell of a heavy response for overestimating how much money drug traffickers made. Yeah, very tricky. I don't, hmm, it's. Too difficult, because I don't particularly trust either side of this. Okay, well, we'll see how you feel in a bit. Yeah, well, that's good. By the end of the story, you might be swayed one way or another. After leaving Mercury News, Gary worked as an investigator for the California State Legislature. His assignments included investigation, investigating racial profiling by the California Highway Patrol, and charges that the Oracle Corporation had received a no-bid contract award of $95 million in 2001. I'm thrilled that there's a company called the Oracle Corporation, because that sounds like a Deus Ex enemy. The Oracle Corporation, making (laughs) life better for you. While working at the legislature, Gary continued to do freelance investigative reporting, sometimes based on his own investigative work, such as an article on racial profiling and traffic stops that appeared in Esquire magazine in 1999. Did he ever do another article about a police horse dying of constipation? I found no record of it. I think he probably did one and that was enough for him. I like, I like to think he did at least one because you know, <laughs> he likes to focus on his area of expertise and I can't imagine there's too many people who've ever reported on that apart from him. In 2000, following a series of affairs, Gary and Susan divorced. However, he remained close to her throughout his life and lived in a house in nearby Carmichael and the two stayed friends. Was this him having affairs? Yes, Gary had affairs. I I, I assumed it was, but, you know, nice to be safe. Gary later moved to the legislature's Office of Majority Services, where he was laid off in February 2004, when Assemblymember Fabian Nunes was elected Speaker. That sounds like like the name of a demon who's come to Earth and disguised themselves as a human. (laughs) Fabian. In 2004, he joined the Sacramento News and Review, an alternative weekly newspaper, where he continued doing investigative work. One of his last articles examined America's Army, a video game designed by the US Army. Mm, I remember that game. I never played it, but I do remember it. To pay off mounting debts, Gary sold his Carmichael property where he was living alone and arranged to move in with his mother. When removal men arrived on the morning of the 10th of December 2004, they found a sign on his front door which read, Please do not enter. 
call 911 for assistance. Thank you. Okay. Inside the home, Gary was found dead with two gunshot wounds to the head. His death was ruled as suicide by the Sacramento County Coroner's Office. Hmm. After a local paper reported that he had died from multiple gunshots, the coroner's office received so many calls asking about Gary's death that Sacramento County Coroner Robert Lyons issued a statement confirming that Gary had committed suicide. When asked by a local reporter about the possibility of two gunshots being a suicide, he replied, It's unusual in a suicide case to have two shots, but it has been done in the past, and it is in fact a distinct possibility. (laughs) Yeah, see, this is the bit where it's like, suddenly those conspiracy theories are looking a bit more believable. True, but I I can't imagine... Two gunshot wounds to the head. Two. That is freaky, but I can't imagine a CIA assassin would leave a note on the door for politeness. To make it look like suicide. True. I don't know. Well, this is just a big old mess, isn't it? News coverage noted that there were widespread rumours on the internet at the time that Gary had been killed as retribution for his Dark Alliance series, published eight years before. However, Gary's ex-wife Susan told reporters that she believed Gary had committed suicide. This was back when the internet was a place to exchange, you know, fun fan fictions, not to say, you know, Hillary Clinton is smuggling children through demon portals. <laughs> so back then, internet yeah. cons- internet rumours probably held a bit more validity. Yeah. Then again, some do today, which are just ridiculous. So. What do you mean? The frogs are being turned gay. <laughs> gay frogs. Susan told reporters... The way he was acting, it would be hard for me to believe it was anything but suicide. He has it quite a low point, hasn't he? Yeah. According to her, Gary had been unhappy for some time over his inability to get a job at any major newspaper. He had sold his house the week before his death because he was unable to afford his mortgage. After Gary's death, a collection of his stories from before and after Dark Alliance series were published. The collection, Mm -hmm. The Killing Game, selected stories from the author of Dark Alliance were edited by his son, Eric. To this day, people are still divided on whether or not he committed suicide. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about this. Yeah, (laughs) this is a... There's so many sort of ways it does feel like a conspiracy, but doesn't at the same time. But I suppose that's the point. Yeah, it's like, if this was... If evidence came out and the CIA were doing all this and then eventually had him killed because he was still pursuing it or whatnot... I wouldn't be surprised. At the same time, if it turned out he was just a very depressed man who felt his life was falling apart and decided to take his own life, I could believe that too. I could easily go either direction. (laughs) He was literally an unemployable, washed-up journalist by the end, so why kill him? Surely that would just draw Mm. more attention to yourself? Then again, the CIA aren't very good at covering things up, as it turns out. Now we all know they were smuggling cocaine. Yeah. But also, yeah, who knows if he was working on something else, a follow-up, had more evidence, you know, the, the internet started to take off more, maybe he's writing online and it would shine more light on what happened. I don't know, you know, it's possible that there could still be reason to kill him off eight years later. I feel like we need a Hideo Kojima-style mo- monologue to sort of run on this <laughs> out and explain how it all makes sense now, even though it doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, I'm quite surprised. I've never heard of this guy. This is really strange. Well, there, there was, there is a film about him. Really, I didn't, I didn't find out until after I'd done the research. Um, <laughs> it came out in 2014. Mm-hmm. It's called Kill the Messenger, oh. and Jeremy Renner stars as Gary. Oh, but, God, yeah! Wow, Hawkeye. <laughs> I went and watched the trailer afterwards, and it's very dramatic. It, it's all big and dramatic, like conspiracy government type things going to Nicaragua and you know it it seems a very dramatized version of events like I think it Mm. is loosely based on his story more than anything it's not so much he wrote a story and then got criticism it's he is delving into a government conspiracy so if you go and watch it take it with a grain of salt but I'm interested enough to go watch the film now (laughs) yeah I'm curious I think the problem with most film adaptations though is they leave out the interesting bits so Mm. Yeah, I'm curious. This is a because I, um, I like the odd, um, you know, strange guy found on a beach with nothing but the page of a Bible and a book of Soviet codes, mm. sort of thing. But I've never heard of this guy. It's very strange. 
unless it was covered up. Mm. And for like such a big story, one that made such huge <laughs> claims, and then it was in the papers for like a year of other people trying to debunk it, and you had all these investigations. It's kind of surprising that it's not a little more known because it's it's kind of a big thing. I just clicked on a, a picture of him after looking at that movie. He looks absolutely nothing like Hawkeye. No, no, he, he really <laughs> He looks like someone's dad. <laughs> He's even got the awful moustache. Yeah, and in the movie they, they changed the awful moustache into cool goatee. So... <laughs> Yeah, which was totally the style in the 80s, 90s. Yeah. yeah, nobody had a goatee back then, unless they were a villain. Maybe they're trying to paint Gary as the villain. It's it's more trying to shun what Gary did. See, that, that was something I did see in... Because I read a few newspaper articles on this. Um, hmm. And there, there was one written, I think it was early 2000s, not long after Gary had passed away, mm -hmm. that was saying that after the... Dark Alliance story came out and he resigned from the Mercury. Most papers kind of made it their mission to just not talk about him, mm -hmm. like almost sort of erase his name. And which is why a lot of people didn't hear about the story. That's like, okay, the story's been out. He's quit. The investigation's done. Let's just, let's just put this whole thing to bed. Let's never mention it again. Yeah. There's a kind of, I don't know. See, again, you can see it from the case of, is it a cover-up that they don't want him employed, or is it just if somebody's that controversial and disgraced effectively, do you want to hire them? Mm. Strange things. I'm just looking up the book, actually, and it got mixed reviews at the time. Interesting. It's a fascinating story, and I do want to read more about it, but it's going to be one of those where even the books you read are going to be completely insane. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to pick up the the book his son put together at the end yeah and and read through that but it, it's going to be a lot of it you kind of got to take with a pinch of salt and think what's the what's the objective of this writer you know what what side are they trying to come from what are they pushing here but still an interesting topic that i do want to sort of read more about yeah the book i learned my lesson with that was i think it was called the silent coup which was about nixon and watergate but after mm. reading it and thinking, wow, I learned so much, it was like, yeah, all of it was just rubbish. It was just <laughs> completely ridiculous. Half the people in, in it were never involved in it. Yeah, I do find that with, with certain things. I find these very interesting topics and start to delve into it, and then you start getting very conflicting accounts, and there seems to be no evidence to support certain claims, and it's like... Just, uh, initially, it looks great, but then it's like, there's nothing to back this up. It's all bollocks. <laughs> The strange, because um, I study his, studied history and politics, I tend to find the things that are more specific are the most mm. unreal, to be honest. It's like the more specific they are with things, the more likely it is they made it up. Mm. It's a weird, I don't know, I, I, I got really into books about the Soviet Union collapsing and it was like, yeah, half the people who said this happened, this happened, this happened, were never even in the room when it was discussed. <laughs> but they specifically they looked up the date and who was there to say it happened. And it's like, no, most people who were there don't remember it. Yeah. No, it, it is definitely a... Uh, it's, it's like we are saying, the, the film. Hmm. You know, it's it, a lot of history, unfortunately, gets that, you know, dramatic effect put on it. And you've got to be very careful. Do you suppose they have a scene where the newspaper sends him off for, you know, weeks to Central America and it's just him phoning up and going, yeah, can I... Tell my story, and they go no, <laughs> and that's it. That that's the that's the movie. It's just him wandering around Central America for three weeks. From the look of the trailer, it's, it it seems more. It seems less of a the newspaper going. Well, we don't think it's right to publish it after these allegations, and more we're being told by the CIA not to let you publish it. You know, it's, it seems much more in your face. There, there is a conspiracy here. Maybe they could have nailed it if they got J.K. Simmons to play the newspaper editor. <laughs> I'm just going to look at the cast. I'm, I'm seeing if it's got his editor listed in the uh, credits. It'll be played by some insanely respected actor now. We've been taking the mic. Well, Tom Hanks one, or uh, unless they've changed the names, I've not seen him here. Th there did seem to be some really, really good cast members in the trailer. There was uh, uh, Robert Patrick. God, it's nice to know he's still working. Yeah, he's doing well. I love Robert Patrick. I just never see him in anything anymore. Ah, yeah, there he is. His editor is played by, and this surprised me because I've not seen this guy in anything for years, Oliver Platt. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, I didn't know he was still acting. Yeah, I, you know, huge in the 90s and then just dropped off the face of the earth, it seems. <laughs> but yeah, he plays uh, Jerry Seppos. I was just trying to remember what what movie I, I was trying to remember what movie I remember him from. It's Lake Placid, that awful uh, crocodile movie. Strangely enough, I did watch that the other weekend when I had the flu and I just threw some shit on TV. <laughs> it's all connected. No, it's yeah, it's a good cast. I'm I'm definitely going to check it out. <laughs> Sorry, I, I double checked that he was in X Men First Class as Man in Black Suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His character never got a name in that, did he? But yeah, he was... Oh, poor. I think that's the last thing I saw him in. Well, I mean, you'd think the film of, you know, Gary's life would involve Man in Black Suit. Mysterious <laughs> Man in Black Suit. Well, they've got Michael Sheen. He's always a great actor. Mm. Oh, wow, Michael Sheen, yeah. So yeah, people, go go watch the film. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm curious to know what people think about this. Do they think it's a conspiracy or do they think it's just a washed-up guy finishing, you know, Ending in a haze of depression. I I have no idea. I it, can't it's a make my story mind up either on way. This. But yeah, I have no idea with this. Well, I'm not sure what we can add about this then. <laughs> no, I think we've said everything that can be said. So, if people wanted to find you online, where can they do that? No, um, if anyone who's listening is based in Northwest, uh, me and a friend are doing an art piece in Foundations Festival in Manchester on the I think the 14th of December. So yeah, come along and see us if you can. Uh, I think we're under the name Isidia because we're very inventive and combined our names together because artists don't do names. And other than that, I'm on Twitter as Nadia Castle. So yeah, let me know your weird conspiracy theories. Actually, no, don't let me know the ones about the chemicals turning people trans. I don't need that one. (laughs) Cool. Well, if people enjoyed this episode, you can find us online. Uh, We've got a Twitter account, which is at eccentric underscore earth. Uh, Instagram has the same handle. We're also on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth. If you want to write in with any suggestions for other topics you want to see us cover or your opinion on whether or not this was a conspiracy or just a a fortunate series of events, our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com. We're on all major podcast providers and YouTube, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode and please leave us a review if possible. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.